Good morning and happy Friday and welcome to a special weedy spotlight, the future of coding, understanding the potential benefits and implementation challenges of ICD-11. It's my pleasure to introduce Weedy's Vice President of Federal Affairs, Robert Tennant. Thank you, Michael. Let me add my welcome and thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy days to join us today. Uh, next slide, please, Michael. So what uh, we have planned for you today is uh, really a deep dive into this new code, code set. I'll start off, uh, talk a little about Weedy and our role, but also talk about the um, potential adoption process uh, for ICD-11. Uh, we'll then move to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kinwa Fong, who is a computational health research branch staff scientist, the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. And then we'll have uh, an expert panel led by our uh, past Weedy board chair, Nancy Spector from the AMA. She'll be joined by Sue Bowman uh, from the American Health Information Management Association, Rhonda Buckholtz, uh, from Vision Innovation Partners, and Tammy Love from the American Hospital Association. Uh, next slide, please. So just for those that aren't familiar with Weedy, uh, we were formed back in 1991 by uh, then Secretary of uh, HHS, Dr. Lewis S Sullivan. He commissioned uh, several reports, which were converted into legislative language, which became what we all know now as HIPAA. Uh, Weedy was named in HIPAA as an advisor uh, to HHS, and we've continued in that role. In fact, we have uh, both CMS and uh, the Office of National Coordinator uh, for HIT on our board of directors. Uh, next slide. So how, how do we do our work? Well, we have hundreds of volunteers. They're the heart and soul of Weedy. Uh, they work through our 18 work groups, sub work groups, and task groups. Uh, we have open uh, forums and virtual spotlights like, like the one you're attending today. Uh, we have a wonderful, now more than 100 podcasts uh, called The Collective Voice of Health IT. Um, and we also have very special member position advisory events to react to, um, for example, uh, proposed rules. So I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about our organization and perhaps uh, get involved, please go to uh, weedy.org. Next slide. So I want to briefly walk through uh, the regulatory adoption process because it's important to know kind of where we are in that, pr that process. So the, any review of code sets, a potential new code of code sets is done by the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics. NCVHS uh, uh, holds public forums. Uh, they put out requests for information, which we'll discuss in a minute, and solicit other input from the industry. Um, they and other agencies will discuss uh, the potential of the United States requiring a proprietary clinical modification, which I know uh, Dr. Fung will get, get into later. Um, ultimately, the, the, uh, the NCHS may make a recommendation to HHS whether or not to adopt ICD-11. That review, um, that, that will be followed by a review by the department and also a, a, a review by the department of any required updates to any of the transaction standards, for example, the claim form that would be necessary to accommodate the new code set. That again would be followed by uh, a notice of proposed rule, rulemaking uh, with a, a public comment period. Um, and of course that could follow and MPRM proposing these updates uh, to transaction standards. Uh, once uh, the public comments are reviewed, uh, then HHS uh, could issue a final rule. And then the industry is given usually a minimum of 24 months uh, to come into compliance. Next slide. So where are we now? Well. Um, we all know that ICD-10 has been adopted by the World Health, Health Organization. It became effective uh, January 1, 2022. This um, federal advisory body, the NCVHS, has sent uh, two letters uh, to HHS encouraging research into the code set. They've established a new work group and held an expert roundtable. 
um, and they released a request for information uh, back in June to solicit public inputs on the benefits and challenges. Uh, they only received 19 responses. I think, um, unfortunately, the comment period was very short. Uh, now, Weedy did um, uh, provide comments uh, to the, the NCHS, but at that uh, round table discussion in August, they decided uh, to re-release uh, an RFI. So if you go to the next slide. So the reason why we're talking about ICD-11 at this relatively early stage in the process is because of this new request for information issued just in October by the NCVHS. Um, they're looking for additional industry input. Uh, they, some of the key questions they raised was related to ICD-11 content and US specific needs. For example, which enhancements and classification content would be most useful? What are the potential be benefits associated with ICD-11? what standards, systems, workforce, and processes must change to accommodate the new code set, and of course, what financial, educational, and human resources will be needed uh, for implementation. Comments are due uh, to um, the NCVHS by uh, January 12th. Next. Uh... So this is really a unique opportunity. You'll hear from uh, the leading national experts on this code, code, code set, but you can also ask questions and you'll be able to um, uh, also contribute because we'll be asking some polling questions uh, throughout the event. But take advantage of the chat feature to make comments, to ask questions and the speakers uh, will be uh, following the uh, chat and we'll be able to try to get those qu questions uh, answered. Um, as always, uh, the slides from today's program and a full recording will be emailed to you uh, following the event. And with that, uh, I think we can go to our uh, first speaker, uh, Kinwa Fong, um, MD, MSMA, Again, is Computational Health Research Branch Staff Scientist with the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. And Dr. Fung, thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction. Um, can I have my slides, please? Okay, thank you. So uh, as Robert mentioned, I am uh, from National Library of Medicine, NIH. And in the past few years, I've been uh, doing some research regarding this uh, brand new uh, version of ICD, which is ICD-11. And most of the research I've done in collaboration with um, uh, NCHS, so the National Center for Health Statistics, not to be confused with NCVHS, which is an advisory body. NCHS, uh, National Center for Health Statistics, is responsible for the uh, creation and the maintenance of uh, of ICD-10 CM, which is uh, directly relevant to the question of how we can use uh, ICD-11 in morbidity coding. So um, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to go, uh, give an overview of ICD-11, mainly focusing on the differences of ICD-11 from earlier uh, 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 versions. And also towards the end of my presentation, I will uh, share with you the findings of a recent uh, study that shows, um, that tries to answer the question whether we need a clinical modification for ICD-11 if we want to use it in morbidity coding. Um, so that will be uh, the second part of my presentation. Next slide, please. So uh, as Robert said, ICD-11 now is, uh, is the official version of ICD since January of uh, 2022. Uh, and uh, on the WHO website, we can see that it's already being in use by at least 35 countries. And the uses uh, include um, causes of death, cancer registries, uh, primary care, and um, reimbursement. Next slide, please. So uh, just like uh, all the other uh, previous uh, releases or major um, uh, versions of ICD, there will be some changes in ICD-11 as expected. So the way I characterize these changes uh, is that I will put uh, the put them into two categories. So first of all, these are the 
usual changes, what I would call incremental changes. Like usually there are more codes uh, in a new system. And usually there will be some rearrangement of chapters or even new chapters to reflect the current state of medical knowledge. On top of that, I mean, there are some uh, changes that we call paradigm shifts. These are things that are brand new features uh, in ICD that are never uh, that are not seen in uh, earlier versions. And this include the following three uh, changes. The first one is the foundation component or the foundation layer and co-clustering and uh, the embrace uh, and, and, and how ICD-11 embraced the digital world is uh, what I would call a major shift from earlier versions. So I'll go into all this uh, in more detail. Uh, next, please. So um, first of all, on the number of codes that are added in ICD-11 compared to ICD-10. So uh, we, can look at, uh, we can look at it in several ways, right? May, mostly we we'll want to compare this to ICD-10. So we'll, we have to make sure that we're comparing uh, like with like. There are altogether about 32,000 codes in ICD-11, but uh, almost half of them co uh, come from three chapters that are not uh, included in the scope of ICD-10. So these three chapters are chapter 26 for uh, traditional medicine, uh, the chapter V, which is uh, for functional assessment, and also chapter X, which is extension codes, which is only used for post coordination. So if we um, uh, disregard those three chapters who are, that are not in RCD 10, and we compare directly uh, the number of uh, codes that can be used for coding, which means that they are uh, leaf level, or we call the lowest level codes that are used directly in coding, uh, disregarding those high level codes that are mainly used for navigation we have an increase of about 20% uh, uh, over ICD-10. Uh, so, which is a moderate uh, kind of uh, uh, increase and not really spectacular. So, I mean, which is uh, seen in earlier versions, earlier up upgrades of ICD uh, uh, classification too. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the chapter organization, so, as I mentioned earlier, ICD-11 has 28 chapters and three of them are not seen uh, in earlier versions. So I will not consider them as um, comparable directly to ICD-10. So uh, we have four new chapters uh, if we regard the last three uh, chapters. Um, so chapter three and four are diseases for blood and blood forming organs and also disease of the um, immune system. They're not really brand new chapters because in ICD-10, we have a chapter three, which combines the two. So basically uh, what ICD-11 does is just separating the uh, blood diseases from the immune system diseases into two chapters. But chapter seven, sleep wake disorders and chapter 17, condition, uh, re conditions related to sexual health, these are brand new chapters and probably reflect the significance and importance of these diseases. Uh, 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 in the medicine uh, overall. Next slide, please. So next I'll go into those uh, really uh, the uh, brand new features or uh, characteristics of ICD-11 that are not seen in earlier uh, versions. So the first one I would like to talk about is the ICD-11 foundation. So what is this new foundation? So basically it is a knowledge base from which the classification uh, which we are, uh, which which we uh, know RCD uh, to be, they are derived. So the idea of building a foundation is that uh, we have a knowledge base which is free from the constraints of a statistical classification. So, for example, the uh, foundation is also a hierarchical structure, but the depth is not limited. Uh, in a classification, in a classical way, in for example, in RCD ten, you have a num certain number of digits, right? And that limits uh, the depth of the hierarchy that you can have, like in ICD-10. But in ICD-11 foundation, that limit is no longer there. So you can have a, a foundation that is uh, of, uh, as, uh, as you can have as, as deep a hierarchy, hierarchy as you need, right? Uh, for, for that purpose. 
And also in the foundation, you can have multiple parenting. For example, stroke will be classified both under neuro and vascular diseases. And you don't need the residual categories like not otherwise uh, specified NOS or not elsewhere classified, which are mainly uh, necessary in a statistical classification. And the foundation is being continuously updated. So that uh, is almost updated daily. So there's no uh, limit as to the uh, as to the time at, uh, uh, for which you can have uh, changes uh, in the foundation. And apart from the foundation, the main purpose of the foundation is to generate linearizations. This is another new term, but it's not a new thing because linearizations are exactly the same things that we use in ICD-10 or ICD-9 for coding. So the main linearization in ICD-11 is called MMS, or the Mortality and Morbidity Statistics, and is comparable to the tabular list of codes in ICD-10. So the linearizations are derived totally from the foundation, and but they, are, they need to be timestamped because they're used for coding, and uh, there is uh, a, a need for a clear versioning, so the people are uh, using the same version to code their statistics. So an analogy of the foundation is that it's a deep sea of terms and meanings, and a subset of the most common and most important terms will appear the, uh, above the shoreline in a linearization that is used for actual coding. So, so the foundation is much more uh, comprehensive uh, and, more, uh, and has a lot more codes or codable entities compared to uh, a linearization like the MMS. Uh, so it, uh, at this point, it has over 120,000 uniquely identifiable conditions. By uniquely identifiable conditions, I don't mean that they have a spe specific code, I mean, in, in the ICD sense. But all these foundation entities, they can be referred to uniquely by the uh, URIs or universal resource identifiers. And they can be potentially exposed for coding in a specific linearization. Next slide, please. Um, yes, so this is uh, uh, showing the two, the, dif the difference between the foundation and also uh, the linearization. On the top is a browser for the foundation. As you can see from the top left corner, uh, top right left corner, sorry, <laughs> top right corner, there's an update date of uh, uh, a certain date. So it's being frequently updated. And in this example of cerebral vascular disease, it is shown that there's multiple parents and this is only possible in the foundation. And below you have the browser which is looking at the um, uh, MMS and it's showing the same condition, cerebral vascular disease, but it's on, the only parent is disease of the nervous system. And you have residual categories like the uh, cerebral vascular disease unspecified in the MMS, which is only present in the linearization, but not um, in the foundation. The next slide, please. So another feature which is brand new in ICD-11 is what we call post-coordination. In ICD-11 terms, it's also called code clustering. This is the idea of allowing combination of existing codes to generate new meanings. So ICD-11 allows two kinds of post-coordination. And uh, the first kind is that we can combine two STEM codes together. STEM codes are the codes that are used in coding generally. I mean, from the earlier chapters from one to 25. And the syntax is that these two codes will be connected by a forward slash. So say if you want to uh, uh, code this condition, urinary tract infection due to extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli, you can combine GC08.0, which is urinary tract infection, site not specified due to E. coli, uh, with this code MG50.27, which is extended spectrum uh, beta lactamase producing E. coli. Another form of post coordination that is allowed in IC11 is that the main code can be modified or qualified by one or more extension codes, which is a specific chapter in IC11. So, and the syntax is that the two codes will be connected by an ampersand. So, for example, if you need to code tuberculosis of prostate, you can use the main code, which is tuberculosis of the genital, uh, genital urinary system, and qualify this with the extension code of prostate gain. 
So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, can you, can we go back to the previous slide? Yes. So um, we have altogether over fourteen thousand extension codes, and you think of the com if you think of the combination of the main codes and the uh, extension codes, and also the combination of the main codes, you can have potentially millions of different combinations. Next slide, please. So the third. A uh, brand new feature of ICD-11 that it is it totally embraces the digital world. So, for example, there are various web browsers like the browser for the foundation, browser for the linearization. So, the main one is MMS. We also have other linearizations like a primary care or low resource setting linearization, and also a linearization for ophthalmology, for example. So, it has, it has various coding tools that is available free of charge on online, and also. Uh, ICD has some uh, uh, web services and resources that are not found uh, in earlier versions. For example, there are application programming interfaces or APIs that allow the direct or programmatic uh, access to ICD-11. So there are also other resources like an implementation guide, reference guide, and also training videos online as well. And also, last but not least, the, the maintenance platform uh, is also online. And uh, if you sign up, I mean, for a, an account, you can make comments and uh, make proposals uh, online, uh, which is uh, facilitates the, the maintenance process. Um, next slide, please. So, well, this is, as I said, put in the title, this is uh, so far just rumor. Um, so rumor has said that IC11 may be the last major revision of ICD because of the capability of constantly updating the foundation and that change, those changes will be propagated to the linearizations. There may not be a need for a disruptive major update, for example, ICD-12. Uh, and also uh, another thing that's been considered by the WHO, which is not uh, definitive yet, is that uh, national modifications like our clinical modification, or the AM in Australia or the CA in Canada, they may lo no longer be allowed. We don't know that yet, but then uh, the licensing and copyright uh, restrictions have not been announced yet, so we don't know. And But um, it is uh, from WHO, uh, it seems that um, WHO is strongly encouraging uh, countries to use uh, national linearization instead of their national extensions. Uh, to fulfill their needs nationally. And uh, rather than, uh, so uh, that is considered a more uh, favorable option because it will keep um, uh, the national coding system more in line with the international uh, core. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of ICD-11? So at least we can see five benefits of moving to ICD-11. So first of all, there's a greatly enhanced capability to capture clinically relevant details. Uh, it's in some chapters of IC11, it, is, it, is undergo, it has undergone very extensive review, like in mental and behavioral disorders that uh, captures the latest um, knowledge in this area. And in the foundation, uh, uh, IC11 captured a lot of the uh, additional content. And one example is the 550, uh, uh, 500 rare diseases that are coming from orphanets. And because of post-coordination, um, it uh, enables a very uh, elegant model called free part model to capture a healthcare related uh, harm, for example. And the second benefit of using IC11 is that, I mean, because of the, and, uh, the uh, of its support of uh, digital and um, uh, uh, computerization, it can uh, lead to a very modernized and automated way of coding. And the third advantage is that IC11 is embracing the idea of graceful uh, evolution. Sorry for the uh, typo. So uh, first of all, the process of updating is very open and transparent and it continues. And people through the maintenance platform can see the changes that are uh, coming. And so there, and, and it may, uh, do away with uh, disruptive major versioning um, in the end as well. So uh, because of the uh, uh, presence of the foundation uh, and which is very rich and which is like uh, very uh, similar to like a 
uh, clinical terminology rather, rather than a clinical classification, it can enhance the interoperability with other uh, terminologies like stoma CT. And finally, um, there's a possibility that with the expressed, uh, with the increased expressivity and the content in ICD-11, um, we can even avoid uh, going to create a full uh, clinical modification for use in the US. Next slide, please. So, uh, so I'll pivot to this study, which uh, we've uh, done with, we've done together with the NCHS, and uh, to examine the possibility of uh, avoiding a clinical modification uh, for using ICD-11 in morbidity decoding. So we have a sample of about 1,700 ICD-10 CM codes coming from two pools. 900 of them are the commonly used codes from all chapters. And this is similar to cutting off the top half of the cake. And uh, we also included in our sample the 800 codes from the whole chapter of digestive diseases. So this is like it's cutting a whole slice of, of a cake. And for each of these ICD-10 CM codes, we'll try to find exact matches in ICD-11 using what we call a waterfall method. So we'll first look at the stem codes in the MMS to see if there's an exact match. And if you don't find one, we'll go to the foundation to try to find an exact match. And failing that, we'll go to uh, use post-coordination. And if that also fails, we'll, uh, we'll propose a new stem code for that um, ICD-10 stem code. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of the recoding exercise. So on the left, you can see all the uh, different uh, steps of the waterfall model. And uh, so for step three, post-coordination, we separated it into those cases that uh, can uh, sufficient to use existing extension code. And we also um, entertain the possibility that some new extension codes might be may need to be added. So if you just focus on the, uh, the third column, which is the cumulative coverage, right? If we go down the waterfall. So if we only restrict ourselves to stem codes, we can cover about a third of the uh, IC10 stem codes in our sample. And if we add foundation entity, it adds about 10%, not, not a lot, but still um, um, uh, useful. But the main game changer is that if we add post-coordination, even if we restrict to the existing extension codes, the coverage already jumped to almost 90%. And if we allow new extension codes, the coverage will go to almost 97%. And only in 3% of the codes do we need a brand new uh, STEM codes uh, for coverage. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we interpret these results? So overall, we think that is it's encouraging that we can cover a lot of um, ICD-10 codes with the ICD, existing ICD-11 codes. But we think that it is also representing the best case scenario. Um, and a lot of things have to happen be, be, uh, before we can achieve this uh, good coverage. So at least there are a few uh, prerequisites, or at least three are worth mentioning here. The first thing is that we need to have post-coordination in order to achieve uh, uh, good coverage. Without post-coordination, the coverage will be drastically reduced. So since post-coordination has not been used in any of the uh, uh, ICD coding in previous versions, so this will uh, probably represent a significant challenge and impact on code, on tooling, coding, coder education, and probably will uh, have some, some impact on coding variability as well. And also we need to uh, ensure that if post-coordination is used, it will be compatible with other messaging and other data standards like HR7, FHIR, and NCPDP. Next slide, please. So another uh, prerequisite for achieving this coverage, good coverage, is that the residual categories are com made compatible. By residual categories, I mean the NOS and NEC codes. And in our exercise, we assume that if uh, they, uh, the wordings suggest that these residual categories match, then we'll take them as a complete match. But uh, if you look, uh, what we need to be ensure is that uh, sometimes the residual categories, even if the wordings are similar, they may not uh, encompass the same uh, conditions. 
So we have to make sure that the hierarchical structure and the coding guidelines for these residual categories are well aligned. So the third prerequisite is that uh, with um, ICD coding, there's a need for uh, coding guidelines, which include uh, an inclusion notes, uh, exclusions, and also an index lookup notes. Um, because these are helpful to, uh, to guide coders to, uh, to know the boundaries of a certain code. So in our previous study, we found that almost 10% of the coding matches are associated with potential conflicts in the coding guidelines. And some of these conflicts may actually affect coding in specific situations. And the most severe coding guideline conflicts can actually render a code unmappable. And I have an example here. Next slide, please. So in our study, we found that this code, uh, FICO impaction K56.41 in ICD 10 CM, is not mappable to ICD 11. Because in ICD 10, uh, FICO impaction is uh, put under uh, K56, which is paralytic alias and intestinal obstruction without hernia. And there's a specific exclusion under FICO impaction that excludes constipation. But if you look at the ICD-11 um, uh, in the bottom half of the slide, you can see that fecal impaction is an inclusion term of constipation. So that means that what is meant by fecal impaction in ICD-10-CM is very different from what is, uh, uh, what, it, what its meaning is in ICD-11. So this will make um, these two terms, even though they, they seem to be lexically exactly the same, they're not equivalent and they're not compatible with each other. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, our finding is that um, using a linearization specific for the US and also augmented by post-coordination and the existing uh, capabilities uh, of post-coordination, ICD-11 can represent almost 90% of the ICD-10-CM codes we examined in our study. So, uh, our conclusion is that it will be a huge missed opportunity if we embark on the full clinical modifications like we did with ICD-9 and ICD-10 without considering alternative approaches. And more detailed finding can be found um, in this uh, reference that I put uh, uh, towards the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what are the benefits of avoiding a clinical modification? So uh, there are at least four benefits that we can see. First of all, uh, we can avoid the cost of creating and maintaining an ICD-11 CM. And if we can do away with a clinical modification, we think it can cut at least, I mean, uh, several years of preparation that uh, needs to go into uh, the adoption of ICD-11. So we can have an earlier use of an up-to-date and international medical classification. The third advantage is that if you do not use, if you do not create a full-fledged uh, clinical modification of IC11, we can avoid the potential divergence of the uh, coding system used in the US from the international core. So even theoretically, and the clinical modifications should be fully compatible with the international core. But however, in the case of ICD-10-CM, we found cases in which this is not true. For example, uh, uh, there's for uh, in ICD-10, there's a category of code called uh, E14, unspecified diabetes mellitus, which is not found in ICD-10-CM because diabetes, diabetes unspecified is coded as type two in ICD-10-CM uh, coding. And the code K68, disorders of retroperitoneum, is not found in ICD-10. So if you can avoid this divergence, it will ensure a higher degree of interoperability between the US um, version of ICD uh, coding with the international statistics. So last but not least, if we can use directly uh, ICD-11 for coding morbidity, we can leverage the ICD-11 uh, foundation for at least two things. First of all, is to achieve alignment with other terminologies like Snow at CT. Note that in the original design of ICD-11, SNOMED was to be used directly to build the foundation. But however, this was, this was not realized for various reasons. But however, there is renewed interest 
uh, to better align the foundation with Snow SCT. And a pilot project has been done to map some codes from the foundation to a Snow SCT. So um, another use of a foundation may be that uh, it can be used to promote or facilitate uh, automated coding because of the rich collection of meaning and terms in the foundation. They can be very useful for uh, designers of, uh, of automated coding uh, applications. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's the end of my presentation and thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to uh, answer questions if there are any. Uh, back to you, Robert. Yep. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fong. Excellent overview of ICD-11. And uh, not surprisingly, we do have some, some questions. And um, the other um, panelists, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to answer the questions as well. Um, Stanley asks, when combining codes, I think that's a very important uh, component of this new code set, does the order matter? Uh, in the first example, does it matter which STEM code comes first, for example? Hmm. Um... I, I don't think the uh, order matters, I mean, uh, in general, uh, but usually uh, if you combine two STEM codes, I don't think the, the, mat, uh, the, the order matters a lot. But if we combine the STEM code with the extension codes, so it's customary to put the main uh, code first and then the, uh, the extension codes uh, following the main codes because that is the focus of the condition. So, I mean, um, but as far as I, I know, I mean, this, the, the order of the com combination of STEM codes, I don't think there's a specific meaning to the order of that. I don't know, uh, Sue, if you wanted to, to comment on that. Yes, thank you. Um, so the, we have to keep in mind that we still have the, the principal diagnosis concept. So that would be one factor that would guide at least the first STEM code selection would be the principal diagnosis. The um, or first listed diagnosis on the outpatient and physician practice side. The he's uh, correct that the secondary STEM codes, there aren't any rules about that. They're they're actually displayed. Um, I don't remember if he covered this or not. They're actually displayed in a code string with a forward slash between them to indicate that these are separate STEM codes, whereas STEM codes that are linked to extension codes are, are displayed with the ampersand symbol. Now there could be multiple extension codes associated with one STEM code, like a fracture that is closed, displaced on the left side and so forth. And there is no rules, at least right now, as to what order the extension codes linked to a particular STEM code uh, should be. I hope that helps answer the individual's question. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Charlene asks, does the supplementary system code means something like the needles that a hospital consumes. Is that a good, a good example? Um, the supplement, um, do you mean the supplementary codes in the extension code chapter? I believe so, yep. So the extension code, I mean, covers a wide range of um, uh, um, uh, areas. So one of them uh, is, like uh, devices or uh, medicaments, and I think, but I don't think it's up to that level of uh, like uh, needles. I think it's more high level, like uh, devices, like pacemakers, and and uh, or joint prosthesis. So, it, yeah, the general idea is that um, medical devices will be covered in extension codes, but uh, it's not may not be up to the level of specificity. I mean, uh, that. Uh, that is mentioned. Yep. Um, Lee Lavathi asks a question that uh, we may be addressing later in the program, but she asks um, how the ICD-11 along with extension codes will be billed in the claim. Uh, the extension code should also be, uh, should, should they also be considered as primary diagnoses? And again, that may be something that we'll address. I don't know, Sue, maybe may uh, late, later in the program. 
Yes, I'm, I'm sure the panelists will discuss this later, but just as a brief response, the, the uh, post coordination and how those extension codes are going to be billed is certainly one of the challenges and how our claim forms are designed that will uh, need to be addressed. And one issue that has not been addressed in the U.S. yet is which extension codes the U.S. is going to consider mandatory. Right now, all of the extension codes are considered optional by WHO. So the expectation is that individual countries will select which extension codes should be uh, reported and they may have like some that are mandatory and some that are even optional within the US uh, because if we used all of them that would be a sort of infinite a number of combinations of codes, which could get to a quite lengthy um, code string. And some of the extension code categories may be less useful in the US. And there's also things like multiple staging systems, which we might pick which one we're going to use, for example. But I'm sure there will be more, be more about that later. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, Christopher asked a question. I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Just want to. Uh, pick back on, on Sue's answer is that which extension codes are uh, mandatory. And I think uh, if you look at ICD-10 CM, right, there are certain areas in which, I mean, when you look at it closely, you think, okay, we are already using some notion of a post coordination. For example, in the injury code, you have um, the initial uh, encounter and the subsequent encounter and so on. Right for every almost every injury code, you add on that the seventh digit. Right, that is very similar to the idea of adding an extension code to an injury code that says, okay, this is an initial encounter, this is a subsequent encounter, and so on. Right, if you think in terms of that, then we can even argue that in ICD-10 CM, there's already a rudimentary um, notion of using post coordination, and because of that, you can imply even that. The idea of um, specifying whether it's initial, subsequent, or, or sequelar is a mandatory extension code that you need to use if you want to use that uh, convention to, uh, to apply it directly to ICD-11 coding. So I would say that, I mean, it is very much um, in ICD-10CM, it is evident what is mandatory or not. But in ICD-11, if you allow the flexibility of post coordination and extension codes, we may need newer or more explicit rules to say, okay, which are the extensions that are mandatory? Like in the example of injury codes being uh, qualified as initial or subsequent encounter. Excellent, I appreciate that. Uh, let, let's do one more qu question and then we've got some polls uh, to put up as well. But Christopher asks a very important question about the concept of this continuous update. Um, are there releases so that groups of updates are done together or are they laterally continuous at any time? And he uh, references the challenges uh, when validating that the codes are valid for date of service when receiving the claim. You can imagine if they're changing, you know, minute by minute, it's going to be extremely challenging. So I think most of the coding will be done through a linearization, like the MMS is the main one. The MMS has fixed timestamped releases, like it is the 2022 February release or 2023 January release. So that's, that will be fixed in time, at least for, I mean, before the next update. But what I'm talking, talking about, the continuous update only happens in the foundation, which is uh, which changes, I mean, uh, with the day and with the, uh, with the, uh, at, at, with, with um, uh, the edit, ed editing that is being uh, done, um, constantly, but um, the foundation is primarily not used for direct coding. So that is not, that that will probably avoid the uh, problem of using different versions. Everybody um, is different, using different versions in coding. I appreciate that. I'll just say, uh, Mara, Mara Shek comments, if the codes are evolving, then the DRG classification system would also have to evolve to keep up. So a very important point. So Michael, I think we have um, a, a, about three poll questions to uh, put up on the screen. You can uh, pull the first one up. And uh, the faculty, feel free to look at the questions in the chat. There are some you may be able to answer in the chat. 
So the first, um, were you involved in the transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10? Uh, Rhonda alluded to the fact that we're all in this same club that we went through this uh, shared experience. And it looks like uh, most of the folks on the, uh, on the program uh, were involved. So uh, we all have that shared, uh, shared experience. Excellent. All right, I think we can uh, close that one. And let's pull up the next uh, uh, poll, Michael. So uh, if you can, rate the benefit to your organization, uh, administrative and or clinical associated with the adoption of ICD-10. Like uh, somewhat beneficial is, uh, is the majority selection, but uh, there's certainly uh, mixed opinions on on that. All right, I think we can close that poll. I appreciate uh, everybody answering, and I'm gonna go to one. You can uh, pull that slide, uh, the uh, poll back up, Michael. I have another poll going on right now, Rob. Okay. On screen is the how long ICD-10 prep and implementation. Keep that up a couple more seconds. Yeah, so it, it took a long time, I think, is the uh, is the bottom line here. So yeah, uh, two to three or more than three years seems to be uh, the average. Great. All right, Michael, it was at the, uh, the last poll for this section. I believe so. That was the third one. We skipped uh, We skipped number two. Great. All right. Well, thank you all again for uh, contributing to that. And uh, with that, I'd like to um, ask Nan Nancy to uh, begin our next uh, panel discussion. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so I'm going to now invite uh, Sue Bowman and Rhonda Buckholt and Tammy Love to have a little conversation and um, talk about uh, some of the aspects of implementation. And um, we'll I'll ask them some questions and then we will I save some time at the end to answer some of your questions. So go ahead and add to the chat uh, any questions that you would like to ask of them. Um, so I guess just to get started, uh, now that you know we're hearing more about the new structure of ICD-11, can you talk about what you see as potential benefits of ICD-11 as it relates to like return on investment, reduced burden, automation, anything else that you want to bring up? Uh, let me start with Sue. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, Dr. Fung did a great job of setting the background for uh, ICD-11 and how it differs from ICD-10. Um, <clears throat> so clearly more up-to-date scientific knowledge is one of the, the benefits. And I think one of the huge benefits is that ICD-11 is, is able to uh, include a lot of medical and technological advancements, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, are just not even possible to add to ICD-10 just because of the fundamental structure of ICD-11. So I see this whole uh, concept of the um, foundation uh, layer the, with the knowledge semantic database and then the linearizations coming off of that is just a huge potential uh, to really keep it up to date with medical knowledge and also hopefully uh, limit or even eliminate the um, idea that we may have to have an ICD-12, that there may just be modest updates to it as we go forward, uh, as, as Dr. Fung mentioned, the foundation layer is continually updated and not have to go through uh, such a painful transition process again. Amy, from your perspective, what do you see as benefits? 
I think one of the things, you know, just uh, learning more about ICD-11, um, I think that hospital or hospitals and healthcare organizations will be really interested in how this transition would differ in terms of the capabilities of AI um, uh, and automation, you know, really trying to better understand that because a lot of organizations are trying to or already have, you know, kind of automated some of that or in the process of trying to automate some of the processes. So I think that is one thing that it would be, you know, it would be very interesting to see. From your perspective, what do you see as benefits? So I think um, really from the provider side, the standardization and the ability to kind of streamline the automation and the data that's going to be available could end up being a huge benefit uh, as, as long as technology will work together. Uh, so it could be a huge benefit for all of that. I also think that there's some uh, benefits to uh, some of the coding system as well, because when you first take a look at I-11, uh, you see it as very complex, but then when you start to break it down, uh, it, it really is is not that complex. And I think that in I-10, we have some of our clinical modifications and then guideline notes that go with that that uh, frustrate the providers on any given time on how to sequence or or I can't code it with this. And, and so I think that I-11 has the opportunity to help that out as well. Okay. Great. Um, I'm interested, uh, you were talking about both, you know, ICD-10 as well. Do you think that the transition from ICD-10 um, to 11 will be similar or what will be um, sort of the, the changes that we'll need to do uh, similar to what we did from ICD-9 to ICD-10? So let me start with Tammy. Uh, thank you, Nancy. I think... Um... You know, having been really very involved with the transition from I-9 to I-10, um, I think one of the things that uh, I, I believe it's been in the RFI and, and has come out of that last meeting in August um, is really trying to help people understand what this looks like, uh, you know, uh, you know, example cases in ICD-10 and ICD-11, what does it look like and what does it take to get there? Um, because there's a lot of practice involved, you know, in a lot of organizations, um, you know, especially with that transition uh, to ICD-10. Um, I don't, did that answer your question, Nancy? Or yeah, sure. elaborate? <laughs> so. Um, I'll go back to you, Rhonda. What do you see as um, some of these, uh, you know, changes that will be necessary going to ICD-11? Does it match up at all to our experience with ICD-10? So I think we we definitely can use the lessons learned um, from ICD-10 implementation. There's going to be a lot that that will mirror steps of implementation. But there's so many nuances that are going to be new that we need to work through. And I think that if we use lessons learned and, and start to tackle this project, one of the things that I think we can all acknowledge is that until we got the backwards mapping, the GEMS files from CMS during the transition before, we didn't know truly what was missing or uh, where there might be some gaps or some nuances. So I think going into this, if we could get that type of information first and really work on, on that to then be able to gap fill and, and work on the implementations. Yeah, Rhonda, thank you for making that point about the mapping, because that was a huge part of a lot of organizations really trying to create their own map, use the maps that's out there. It was a it was a process and very necessary in terms of what was needed, especially to kind of be able to track your own internal data. So, And I would just add that okay. I agree a lot of the steps will be similar, but I think that uh, I'm hoping we do a much better job this time around and starting the conversation early like we are now will we'll hopefully help with that. But I think some of the lessons learned from the last round was engage all of the stakeholders early and often. Um, coordination and communication are key 
and getting uh, the um, claims uh, systems and other uh, EHR and other systems and the vendors up to speed and making the changes early so providers aren't waiting on their vendors as the compliance date is fast approaching, I think will make the whole process go a lot smoother. I also think we need to look at ways to minimize the burden on small providers and rural uh, providers and even small health plans, Medicaid and so forth, to come up with um, grants or other ways to help them with funding uh, to, to make this transition. So it's not as painful perhaps for some people as the last round was. And I also think there's there are some nuances as Tammy and Rhonda alluded to that are a little different this time, like how to handle the post coordination issues, for example, and how that's going to look on a claim and how we're going to make sure the linkages uh, stay together through the whole claims processing process. Because if a payer gets a bunch of extension codes that say left and right, and they're not linked to anything, it's gonna be pretty, pretty meaningless. Yes, yeah, so Sue, so, like I think, it's really important too. like I my brain started like going in overdrive when we have the thought that there might be more frequent updates and ongoing updates of, wow, how do you train in that environment and how do you audit in that environment? How do you change your policies and your procedures? And uh, I think really thinking through all of that is 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 going to be so important. And one of the Oh, go ahead. Nancy. I'm just going to say you brought up training. And I guess the one thing that I see different with ICD-11 versus ICD-10 is just how we'll go about training coders and what the coding experience is going to be with ICD-11. Have you guys started to think about that in terms of, you know, education? I think some of us are still trying to understand ICD-10 <laughs> But, um, you know, I mean, there's, it's been out there a while, but I think that's going to be a big, uh, a bigger challenge. It just feels like to me, just knowing what I know at this point in terms of education, but I could be wrong. I, I you know, it's, you know, more about the nuances and how, how those are going to, how those concepts work and how, um, uh, you know, internally, how those are going to work with our systems or, and what are we going to have to do to uh, accommodate those and things like that, so. I also think that if we uh, don't have a, the need for a full-blown clinical modification and are using um, the ICD-11, the WHO ICD-11 version, or maybe there's some sort of, you know, U.S. linearization where we have some U.S. specific content, but it's not at all as extensive as what we have in our current ICD-10-CM. I think that being able to use the ICD-11 tools that WHO has provided is a terrific opportunity to reduce a lot of um, expenses. I've gone through some of their training materials on their website. I've used their coding tool, which which is almost kind of like a mini encoder. And it's very easy to use, very easy to learn, and you can do it on your own and it's free. So I think that's going to be an enormous opportunity going forward. I also think uh, that we're going to need to think about upskilling the workforce. Um, as others have talked about, there's a huge opportunity to automate a lot of this uh, coding under ICD-11. And so there's going to be... Uh, opportunities, I think, for coding roles to move into an auditing and validation type of uh, role. So I think we're going to need to really upskill the workforce as well. I Can I just jump in and say that um, I echo Sue's point. I mean, if we can avoid a clinical modification, we can just make use of the existing tools. I mean, that we have already have, like um, on the WHO website and from other sources. And also, there's already uh, somebody talk about maps, and there's already a set of maps from ICD-10 to ICD-11 in both directions that I mean, maybe we can leverage, I mean, to help transitioning uh, from ICD-10-CM to ICD-11. I mean, if we can avoid a clinical modification, that would be easier. I mean, the maps will be more useful, I mean, because the target is ICD-11. And uh, if we're using it directly, then uh, those who, those maps will also be a useful resource. Thank you. Great. So um, I think it was you, Rhonda, who brought up this idea of um, 
getting the mappings earlier on. So it kind of, it speaks to this idea of, you know, the steps that you're going to take in your transition process. And a lot of those steps are overlapping, but um, do you want to talk about um, a little bit about what you see as the transition steps um, that will need to be taken during this process? And um, I guess I'll start with you, Rhonda, since I um, mentioned that you had brought this up already, but yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we're, we're talking steps and especially once with the backwards mapping and education, I think that learning the codes or the principle of the coding in, in I-11, to Sue's point, is simpler to, to a certain extent and in in that there's tools there. But the challenge, on especially on the provider side, is always going to be the challenge on the provider side. Uh, we, we've got to make sure that we're going to have the right technology use and the ability to actually use them and implement them well, but also to make sure that the documentation is now going to hit what's in that whole string. And documentation, as you know, in, in a provider setting is, is always that nuance that, that throws us back off. So I think right from, from that, really addressing that those training needs and what's going to change from the vendor perspective um, and then really start working because at the end of the day, when we went through ICD-10 implementation, uh, you know, it, most of our vendors were ready. There were a few that, that dropped out, right? Most of our vendors were ready. Uh, the organizations were ready. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was the, it was the doctors that were providing the care that weren't 100% ready. And so I think we have to really look at those timelines and make sure that we engage them um, ahead of time. And you can't, I don't think we can do that until a date is at least established. Is it two years? Is it five years? Is it, right? Um, I just, I don't see how, how else you get engagement to, to get that kind of work done. So what are your thoughts on this? I, I, I really agree with um, what Rhonda said. There's getting people engaged uh, until, until there's more firm idea of when we're talking about is, is difficult. But I think starting the conversation now, starting to look at what needs to change, coming up with processes for the changes that need to be made, having the discussions with the stakeholders as to what they need, what uh, tools they need to, to move forward. I think that's all um, very important and, and can be done early and emphasized often. Sure. And Tammy, um, I'll give you a chance to <laughs> add to this as well. Yeah, I can echo everything that Sue and Rhonda said. Um, and, you know, the one thing that I would add is uh, just, you know, trying to you know work with and working with all of your payers and I think Rhonda had mentioned all the vendors um, that that is a huge undertaking um, depending on you know the the volume of payers and vendors that you have and within the organization that you work in um, I think the documentation uh, again Rhonda you said that about you know really working with your physicians and not you can't engage them too early because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to hear about it until we have, you know, a firm date. Um, you know, truly really trying to understand what is, what are the changes going to be in terms of, do we document differently? How is it, how is it different? How is it the same? And incorporating those concepts in our EHRs and uh, our physician education. So. Bringing up the, the point about the vendor, it um, makes me think about, again, going back to um, the, the sort of smaller providers, the practice side of um, providers, that many of them rely on their vendors for their, you know, practice management system updates, their EHR updates, all of that software system changes that are necessary. Um, there's a lot going on in health IT right now. I, I, I guess the um, sort of asking it as a question, but I don't know if it's if it's really a question. Other than to say, you know, there's there's a lot of other you know requirements, priorities, changes that are going on. Um, how do you think the industry is, you know, 
going to react to that or prepared for that? I know this was a big question. Again, there's never a quiet time <laughs> in in terms of when to stage a, such a big implementation like this. But any thoughts on you know how the industry can prepare for what could potentially be some big overlapping system changes? Well, well I can I mean, oh, go, go ahead, Tammy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say that um, I know that in the response to the first RFI, there was um, there were some comments about coordinating with other regulatory timelines and initiatives going on, which I completely agree with. But I also say that, which is something we experience with ICD-10 as well, that we don't really have a quiet time in healthcare <laughs> where, well, now nothing else is going on. Let's do ICD-11. So, you know, there was a lot of comments about, well, wait till these things are done, you know, TEFCA and some of the other things going on. Wait till all this is done. Well, that assumes that when those things are done, we're not going to have new regulatory deadlines and issues that need to be addressed. So, somehow we need to work ICD-11, you know, into the process and, and we can't, um, we can't think we can just sort of save it for when there's nothing else to work on because I have, in my whole career, I've really not seen that period of time. <laughs> so, and I think, I think one thing we can maybe do better this time around is really engage the vendors directly in the conversation and the process. I think maybe before we, a lot of our communications and discussions and interactions were with providers and payers. And we sort of thought, well, they'll work with their own vendors. Well, that didn't work out so well. I think we need to involve the um, vendors directly in the discussions and the process. And so they have a clear understanding of the changes in ICD-11 and the changes that they will need to make to their system so that they can have a, a better estimate of how long it's going to take them to complete those changes. Yeah, based on the poll, I mean, uh, we already saw that, you know, those that responded, it was two to three years or beyond three years in the preparation. Um, I mean, it, it would be hopeful not, that it wouldn't take as long this time, you know, because it's pretty fresh in our minds. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the most recent uh, transition, you know, really kind of, I guess, dusting off that list to see all of the things that, you know, we did with that transition and what are the things that we're going to have to touch now, what's new, what's, um, what, what we may not have to touch uh, this time, but probably all of those things and maybe some additional things just based on the concepts of ICD-11 versus ICD-10. I'm just going to chime in and say, right, if we're if we're imagining a space where we make it easy for us to be able to implement from the provider side, like my, my docs are tired, they're tired, remove some of the regulatory burdens like we talk about with other weedy work groups and, and that type of thing. There's so many regulatory burdens that are placed on providers right now to throw another change like this onto them. Uh, I don't know how you create an environment where they can succeed in that. Uh, so I, it, I think it's something you have to think through and it's not anything that's gonna go away. None of us have that magic wand, but uh, we have to, I think we have to really consider those types of things. That's a good point, Rhonda. You know, I think everybody in healthcare is, is tired <laughs> you know, because it is very regulatory uh, heavy um, all the time, so. And you were just talking about, you know, and speaking about people in the health system who are tired, um, you know, the last time around, we heard a lot of the coders saying, oh, I'm retiring before this gets implemented. Um, I'm done. Uh, you know, I can't do ICD-10. And I'm guessing we're going to hear some of the similar reactions to ICD-11. Um it, what is the workforce like there? I mean, there was a lot of concern with IC10 that there were a lot of retirements and was there going to be sort of that fresh new generation of coders coming up? Um, do you have a sense of the workforce? Well, I can start there. There certainly is still a coder shortage out there, but one mm -hmm. opportunity for ICD-11, I think, is with increased automation of a lot of the coding, 
we, we can hopefully, uh, that will hopefully help with that situation because we may not need as many actual coders to do all of the manual coding. So that's, that's the hope that we can automate a lot of, um, a lot of these processes and help to alleviate um, the coder shortage. And hopefully the, the coders that are out there will find ICD-11, you know, an exciting opportunity. And a lot of them I've heard from, uh, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them actually found learning ICD-10, you know, was not as horrible as they might've initially anticipated and they actually like using it now. So maybe going through that process once, a lot of them had not been around for the previous uh, version change. So it was a kind of a new thing for them to go from nine to 10. So having done that once, um, hopefully they'll feel more confident and comfortable moving forward with ICD-11. But I think once people take a look at it and start playing with the coding tool, you know, it's actually kind of fun to use. I would say, and it's it's um, very clear and and understandable in a lot of ways, and I think that will be encouraging. But I think the um, opportunities for AI and automation, as Tammy had mentioned earlier, uh, are are huge for the um, to address the coding workforce issues. Yeah, yeah so I agree with Sue. Go ahead, yeah, Rhonda. No, sorry. Yeah, to to Sue's point, we we heard a lot of people that said they were going to retire. Um, probably a whole bunch of us on this call also made that same joke. Um, so, uh, but if you guys remember, uh, AAPC actually required a new test to uh, certify that they were uh, proficient in ICD-10. And I can tell you, uh, you know, obviously there's always concerns that people will say, no, I'm not going to do this. So uh, that did not happen. It was a very, very, very small percentage of coders that said, I really am done. So I, I don't, I don't think that I don't, to Sue's point, there is a, a shortage of, of coders uh, that it, it out there in the marketplace, we could fix that and, and help our coding um, by getting rid of risk adjustment audits and managed care. But that's a different topic. So um, I think that from a coding standpoint, we have a, a new young generation that's coming in that that would be eager to, to learn and embrace. And they are much more technology capable mm -hmm. than we are. Um, and uh, I was just thinking about um, the, just the, uh, um, thinking about the data as well. You know, we've been talking very much about sort of that coding for probably payment and reimbursement. I think that's kind of been implied in a lot of what we've been talking about. But really today, and, then, and maybe it's not that much different from what it was before, but it seems like our awareness of how those diagnosis codes are used in so many other ways after that initial coding. Um, can you speak at all to, uh, again, probably, um, um, sort of know where you're going to go with this, but speak it all to those other uses of the diagnosis codes and, and what ICD-11 will bring to that. So like the public health, the social determinants of health, the, um, you know, the V surveillance, case management, all those other activities that happen after the patient scene when we're that diagnosis code. Um, Tammy, why don't we... Do you have any thoughts about ICD-11 for well, those users? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I, um, I think it's going to help in some ways and maybe <clears throat> per, I present challenges in other ways. And one of the things that came to mind that I know there was a tremendous amount of time, you know, spent on in terms of all your NCDs and LCDs and updating those or not me personally, but working with um, the organizations that do update those um, and how this ICD-11 will, you know, benefit that, I, I don't know, you know, that's, for me, it's kind of one of those things to, you know, to, to be determined. Maybe Sue has a better, a better idea on that, but I just, I just thought of NCDs and LCDs all of a sudden. <clears throat> Yeah, obviously, with uh, more detailed data, more up to date scientific knowledge, you, you know, you could anticipate that it would help improve the public health initiatives, quality measurement. We know the the ICD eleven has a lot of coverage related to uh, patient safety uh, issues, so that provides a huge opportunity for uh, better better data. I think 
I think some areas that still uh, need to be examined, here's some follow-up research for Dr. Fung to consider, I guess, is uh, how well ICD-11 uh, covers some of the areas that we have focused on a lot in recent years in, in the ICD-10 world, such as genetic related diseases, for example, uh, rare diseases. There's a lot of uh, rare diseases content in the foundation layer, but not as many as some of the codes we have in ICD-10-CM in the MMS, the um, linearization level. So looking at how that content fits with what we have in ICD-10-CM, what we actually really need to have codes for. Also the expansion we've been doing in recent years for social determinants of health, because that's such a huge focus in the US right now and looking at um, does ICD-11 do as well picking up on the social determinants of health coding as we have been doing in ICD-10-CM. I think these are, are all questions that still need to be addressed. So I just want to pick a bit on that and to say that, I mean, the, the idea of post-coordination is almost like mentioned to be uh, as, as an obstacle to implementing IC11. So I would like to flip it a little bit to say, okay, this is a brand new opportunity because post-coordination or code clustering is really elegant way of expanding the, uh, the realm of information, uh, expanding the realm of um, attributes that you want to capture in the most economic way. For example, I mean, if you want to add something that you want to capture in ICD-10, CM, for example, you need to add a code. And then if you want, if that requirement is, co is, is covering a broad um, uh, range of codes, then you need to add uh, many codes, I mean, to, to, to have that effect. For example, if you add to, want to add uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, uh, for example, to a certain um, condition, then you need to, to you need to add a number of codes to all the infective um, in conditions that is relevant to that to that uh, to use case. But with host coordination, you only need to say, okay, you have this extension code that if you combine this with this condition, you already get the meaning you want in an unambiguous way. I think that is a very powerful idea. And if IC11, I mean, if postcoordination is really, I mean, implemented and proved to be implementable in a, not a too difficult way, it can revolutionize the way that information is captured in, in codes. So we can see that as an opportunity, really, I mean, to have a brand new way and very efficient, very elegant uh, way of capturing information that is so much more flexible and expendable than what we have in, in Intensia. Great. Um, I think it might be interesting. We've been talking a lot about, you know, these different steps in, in a implementation process. Let's, um, Michael, do you want to bring up the poll um, that talks about the hurdles? What were the largest hurdles for ICD-10 implementation? And um, I know this is about IC10, but um, just getting a sense of where we had challenges in the past, which could help us to drive then um, how we plan for the ICD11 implementation. So let's see what folks had to say were their biggest hurdles. Give it another minute or so. It looks like still a lot of responses coming in. Okay, looks like we've got a pretty good uh, response there. Um, and it looks like really those challenges with the software system upgrades. Uh, that seemed to be the the winner in terms of the hurdles. I'm kind of surprised that the financial resources wasn't higher up. The ICD-10 training being um, second highest and that decreased productivity. Looks like that one came in third. So interesting. Any reaction from our panel about um, what you're seeing there? <laughs> 
does that track with uh, what you were hearing as well? It doesn't surprise me on the uh, uh, the internal, the software challenges, policy upgrades. I mean, that that is a, a lot of, um, it was a lot of work <laughs> so, for, for that transition for sure, so. So I, I'm gonna tell you, I'm surprised by two things. One, just to your point, Nancy, the financial resources, because that was cited so often during ICD-10 implementation. But then I think Sue and I can, and, and, and Tammy via, right, can say training. <laughs> How could that have been a struggle? <laughs> we offered it so many ways. <laughs> but yeah, um, so I am surprised on the training and, and the percentage that's that it's that high. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little surprised on the training as well, particularly since uh, uh, we had so many delays and then people were retrained. And I, I had a lot of coders telling me, well, I know, you know, I've practically got ICD-10 memorized. I've learned it so many times now getting ready for the new compliance date. So uh, that one that one does kind of surprise me, but not at all the systems upgrades. As, as we had talked about earlier, we know that um, some of the vendors were behind in, in getting their systems upgrades finished, and it was cre creating a lot of stress and challenges for the providers. So hopefully uh, we can do a better job with that the, the next time around. And with some of the training resources that WHO has, that might um, help alleviate some training uh, stress and cost uh, going forward. And we're hoping with the opportunities for with, with being in a, a different digital world now, even than when we implemented ICD-10, hopefully um, the opportunities around AI and automation as we move into ICD-11 will alleviate the productivity declines and that we saw when we transitioned to ICD-10. Okay. I was looking at the chat, so we'll transition and answer some of the questions in the chat. Although, um, Rhonda and Sue, you were both answering questions along the way. So I was trying to find um, if there were any that we really didn't hit on. Um, I see there was a question about the downstream impact where um, many benefits are tied to diagnosis codes. We did start talking about the other use cases downstream use of diagnosis codes. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say about benefits potentially there. Hopefully we got to Kathleen's question there. I don't know if it was more about the LCD NCD topic or if it was something else. So um Medical if, necessity. If it, yeah, if it's from a coverage standpoint, mm -hmm. it, from, from a bent true benefit, right, a coverage standpoint right. from a health plan, uh, it, it would be intriguing to see what changes could be made or, or not made. Uh, I, I, I feel like, in essence, more things might actually end up being covered than what is shown in ICD-11 because I do feel that that we do have a higher level of specificity uh, that that you know points out some other things that maybe isn't there so much. It's combined right with other codes and and I eleven. Yeah, and as we move into different reimbursement models and value based care initiative, I think the. Um, the increased detail as well as the up-to-date clinical, not only clinical concepts, but clinical structure within ICD-11 will facilitate uh, a lot of those processes as well. And hopefully we'll be in a, in a better place. Um, I see that um, there were some questions that were sort of technical in nature. And um, one of the questions was asking about the um, the fact that there's the backslash sign and the ampersand sign used in um, the coding. Now that's with the um, extension codes uh, or the post coordination, but how those are characters that are already used in IT coding scripts like HTML. So I think that's. That's potentially and probably not for us to answer right here, but um, something that will need to be looked at. 
one one comment um, I can add to that is that, that will need to be something I think we discuss in the U.S. is how we sh um, handle the linkage in claims processing and EHRs and and other systems. I I don't I think there has to be a way obviously to display the end code. And um, one thing I should point out is that if STEM codes are unrelated to each other, they're listed in separate fields, separate lines or whatever, just like today. So if you have diabetes and pneumonia, you know, they're, they're not linked with a forward slash or anything else. They're completely separate codes, just like they are today. The slash is used to link STEM codes and the ampersand is linked to show the, or used to show the linkage with extension codes. But I think within um, systems, there's ways to just do that in the background to link it. The challenge will be making sure the linkage crosses um, systems and doesn't get lost along the way so that you have a bunch of extension codes and a bunch of STEM codes and no idea you know, what goes with what. That's kind of my concern, or I guess even worse, they're linked to the wrong thing. Um, so I think there's a variety of ways that that can be done, um, you know, in the back end. But then, when you're when you're displaying the full code and trying to show what goes with what, there will be need to be some sort of way to do that. To say yes, you know, the left goes with the uh, breast cancer and the right goes with the the fracture, and not the other way around, for example, or no, you know, no idea where it goes. So I think that's going to be some uh, challenges for the U.S. to figure out. And really, the U.S. is a little bit more unique in this regard. Uh, this level of force coordination is new for um, other countries as well. But some other countries have done it uh, more than the U.S. has. Uh, Dr. Funway is a good example about the initial and subsequent encounter, which is a kind of post coordination. But a lot of other countries have already done that with laterality where they have a separate data element for laterality and do not have all the pre-coordinated codes to identify laterality that the US has. So they're a little bit further ahead in thinking of how to link different codes together than we are. I, we're actually coming up towards the end of our time. Um, like I said, I was seeing a lot of the um, entries in the chat were either answered or, or were more so comments and not necessarily um, questions per se. So um, Rob, uh, should I kick it over to you to do a few wrap up comments? Yes, uh, Nancy, thank you so much for moderating that excellent panel, a really uh, interesting discussion, uh, a look ahead at uh, some of the issues we'll need to address if we do in fact, move to ICD-11. Um, I did want to reiterate, and we had a question on this in the chat, that HHS has not made the decision yet to move forward. We're much more so in the fact-finding uh, stage, and I am going to um, put in the chat again the link to the NCVHS request for information on ICD-11. That is the catalyst for this program today. NCVHS wants to hear from the industry on these issues that we've discussed today. So please um, review the RFI and comment if your organization has an interest in the, this issue. Um, and uh, I wanted just to say a few words. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you to our expert faculty, uh, Dr. Fong, Nancy, Tammy, Sue, and Rhonda, a wonderful um, information you shared with, with the audience. Um, I, I also wanted to thank you, the audience, uh, for uh, putting so many great uh, comments in the chat and asking so many excellent questions as well. Uh, th th thank you for completing the polls. It certainly helps us to understand a little bit more about the environment. And with that, um, I will um, suggest to you, we do have two upcoming uh, free events for the industry on uh, December 7th. We have a health plans guide to interoperability in 2024 and beyond uh, presented by Co Cohere Health. And EdFX is um, offering a free webinar on the 12th, uh, Technologies Growing Impact on Value-Based Care Acceleration. 
So with that, I will uh, thank Michael McNutt, my colleague, for always uh, doing a wonderful job with making sure these events run so smoothly. Um, any information you're interested in learning about WEDI, our work groups, our education, uh, please uh, go to www.weedy.org. And with that, I will uh, close the program. And again, thank you so much. Thank you.